Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. Oh, how you doing? Talking about email. Here, excuse, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so we're, oh, good. Oh, good. My cat's been going on and off around here. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've been okay and learning so much this morning. So, super fun. Um, so, we're actually going to talk about building a hundred million dollar D to C chocolate empire. So, it just gets better. This title, like as you go on, move from word to word. Uh, so let me introduce you to Jake Carls, everyone. So Jake is the co-founder and rainmaker and midday squares and resident social personality. In other words, he builds relationships and makes noise. At midday squares, they manufacture functional chocolate bars. So everything a chocolate bar isn't and everything a protein bar wishes it was. I love that line, by the way. So Jake, thank you so much for being here and welcome to your email edge. Um, let's jump right into it. I have a bunch of questions for, for you. Let's see um, how that goes. So uh, first question is, and we're going to talk about challenges a little bit in the beginning. So I'm hoping you could share with us the two initial challenges when establishing Midday Squares as an online DTC brand and how did you navigate them? So yeah, thank you for having me, first of all. And uh, yeah, Midday Squares is a refrigerated chocolate bar. So we don't live in the typical, you know, area of where shelf stable products are. So our biggest challenge since, you know, at the beginning and currently still is somewhat of a challenge is that we have to ship refrigerated, meaning that chocolate refrigeration is very difficult. It melts, it goes bad if it's too long, you know, because you don't use preservatives or additives. So that was a very hard thing at the beginning to decide how we were going to build a business based on, you know, very intense ways of logistics and a very expensive way of logistics, right? So when we started the business, the second big challenge we had was we didn't have a following. We didn't, no one knew who me, my, who I was, who my sister, who my brother-in-law was, who were my partners. So what we did was a very unique strategy to get people to try the midday square, you know. Right now, the midday squares, you know, are two forty nine per bar, and if you want to buy on our website, you have to buy two boxes just to make sense of the logistics. So it ends up being a fifty dollar purchase. But at the time, when people don't know who you are or what your product is, to get them to spend fifty dollars is probably outrageous. It's 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 something that's very difficult. So we did something very unique. We actually created a online sample program to avoid this challenge. And what it was was we charged twenty five cents per bar. And what that meant was you got a you got a chocolate bar, but you also got us to hand deliver because we couldn't afford shipping. So in the region where we started was Montreal, Canada. We would actually hand deliver every single night to meet the consumer and ask them why they bought it. And the idea was we wanted to have so much personalization and we put that 25 cents at the price point, not because it, it was a way to make money or to get back our costs. It was a way to ensure that we weren't getting freeloaders trying the product. They had to put their credit card down. So we actually knew that there was an opt in. And that was a huge thing. So we did that for about three months and that built a lot of traction for the brand. And at the same time, we were telling our story on social media, which was going viral, meaning that we were just sharing how we build this business, showing the behind the scenes of the company. And people felt this immense amount of humanization and personalization. And then suddenly over time, that led us to becoming a D2C brand and a uh, retail brand at the same time. I love how like in the beginning of things, before you actually do things that scale, you have to do things that are not scalable. And yeah, I love that example. Thank you well, so much for sharing. Mariana, yeah. one thing that we did that was unscalable that we tried to still, as we built a hundred million, as we still try to scale it is every first time customer actually receives a Polaroid picture from the, from the three, my partners and I doing a funky pose and we actually hand write a note to the customer saying, thank you. At the beginning, we used to actually look the person up on social media, get to know them a little personally and write something really, really personal. We can't do that today because obviously there's a lot more customers than we had at the beginning. But what we do do today is we still do a funky picture. We figure out how to automate these pictures, but also get my mother and her team that she's created to write personalized messages. They aren't looking at you on social media, but they are personalizing a, a custom message, which still gives that sense of, this brand cares about the consumer. And when you humanize and personalize as much as you can, people feel like they're buying from a friend rather than a just a transaction. And that's a powerful thing that I think more brands need to figure out is how can we continue to humanize? Whether that's, you know, send a video to the customer on social media, person mentioning their name, or do you get handwritten notes? But mentioning their name is a super important thing because that means that they are heard, they're acknowledged, and they're appreciated. 
That's so true. Oh my gosh. I, I love that. I didn't know about the about the pictures. That's so cool. Um, yeah, I want to hear about more brands trying that out. Well, the probably growing brands too. Um, so I actually have a long question now. Um, you're known for boldly building media experience out loud. And in one of your interviews, I watched a few of them, you mentioned that your first hire was a videographer, videographer, and to make sure every bit of your story was captured as it enrolled. Uh, so where, were there any challenges in balancing authenticity with maintaining a positive brand image, especially in the context of all the uncertainty of building a business? How did that go? So yes, this is an amazing question. I think it's important. Um, authenticity is the only way to break through in the world full of inauthenticity. So when you are yourself and you are unapologetically yourself, people feel that energy. They either love it or they hate it. And if they love it, they're diehard fans. If they hate it, they'll never engage with you or they'll engage in a negative way. But for us, we knew if we wanted to win this chocolate game, we weren't going to win by being the number one best tasting product because that's great and all. We are a great product and a very we have product market fit and all that stuff, but you needed more than that. We needed a little bit more. And what we did was I told my partners, if we share and document the entire journey, meaning that we share the good, the bad, the ugly of how we build this business, showing you therapy sessions, breakdowns, milestone, burnouts, how we fire, how we hire, how we raise money, things you never get to see in a corporation, then that will strike through this world of attention and actually grab attention at a way faster and more efficient rate than it would be to sell the product to the consumer on advertisements and D2C stuff. So what we did was we started sharing our whole journey, our private lives, our personal lives, um, the business life, and it was working. And we started getting a lot of traction, a lot of organic views, a lot of virality, and people were starting to opt into our journey, feeling like they were part of this journey, meaning that they felt the good and the bad of emotions that we had to go through. And the good side of that is that you build real fans that will be diehard and diehard for your business and do whatever they can to help sell your product more and more and more. But then the second side of it and the challenge is that you have trolls. You have a lot of trolls out there. You have a lot of negativity that will come in because people don't like when people are actually being themselves because it makes those individuals feel a little bit insecure about themselves because they're not they're not being themselves. So at the beginning of this journey, it was very hard to deal with all the trolling that we were getting. And it's not it's not crazy amount, but it was still like, you know, mean comments, um, you know, hateful comments. And it hurts because you take it personally because it's your business and it's who you are. And especially it's about your personal life. You definitely think it's personal and it is. But I started to realize over time that this isn't a me problem. It's a, the, a them problem. It's the person that's actually doing it. They're suffering. So the way we look at it now is with all the challenging, you know, rude comments and, and mean stuff is I try to go out and help them. I actually ask them, hey, is everything okay? And six out of 10 times, seven out of 10 times, these individuals are just having a bad day and take it out on the brand or the individual that's being transparent and vulnerable. And it makes them feel uncomfortable. Three out of se three out of 10 times is just mean people. So you just block them. But most of the time, it's just an empathetic thing that you need to do. And it's not a problem that is personally on you. So I think that that's the disadvantage of building out loud is you're going to have a lot of that emotionality hit you, but you're also gonna have the greatness of seeing what real fandom looks like. Because when you build trust and you're relatable, you're really building friendships with your customers, which don't just buy your products, they shout about it every day. I love that. And I I think that's so, it requires a lot of therapy, you're right. And especially because that also means if, if the mean comments are not, um, like are not personally attacking, to attacking you is actually something that's uh, about the person. That means the good comments are also about the people that are commenting on it, right? So it's not about you again. So whatever is about you, it's only what's within you. So that's that's yeah. so cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so I was wondering about um, about yeah about your whole storytelling strategy and how much it's actually focused on building consumer trust. Do you also rely on it to increase conversions? And what other strategies and channels do you use for that? So first of all, storytelling is the forefront of our business. So documenting and sharing the good, the bad, the ugly. We have videographers, we have editors. It's like a media team within a chocolate factory. So it's kind of very unique. And that what that does is it's, it cr increases the conversions over time. And what I mean by that is when you watch our story, first, you're very curious and you're like, what is this? You're like, this. what are they selling? There's like that you don't even know it's drama, it's chaos, it's, it's, it's family, it's family drama. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's literally good, bad, ugly. So you're confused, but you're curious. It piques curiosity in the human nature component. 
then we you watch another video and you're like wow this company is really interesting who are these people so you continue to watch you go down our path our our like we'll call it our journey of content and you start to slowly become a fan of the brand before even trying the product so then when we finally hit you with more of a here's the function of our product here's what we sell you're then already opting in as a fan of what we're doing or not a fan and you're not you don't even want to see our stuff so what that does is it creates the fan before they buy the product. So the conversion in the end is actually higher because over time they're going to buy and they're buying into something that they already have an emotional bias before they eat the product. So it's, it's a win win, but the idea is if, it, if the product didn't taste good, they'll probably move on from it after. But again, product market fit kicks in after that. And that's why it's important to have product market fit. So I think that other strategies that we use is email. Um, we use um, influencers on social media. I think that that's a very big thing for us because we're not just a D2C business. We're also a retail business. So we actually have influencers talk about both, hey, buy, our, buy on our website, buy online. You know, here's a discount code. And they talk about the review of the product and they show, they show it in their lifestyles. And the second thing we do with them is we actually have them go to stores and show where the product is because we're refrigerated. So it's complex to find it. So we have them show that to their audiences. And when you do that consistently, not just once, but you invest in it, you know, over months of time of that person's content, it becomes familiar in their fan bases. And then their fan bases then comes to your community. So then we put them down our conversion system, which is basically organic content, curiosity, then strike them with a sales, a sales method. And then they go on our email list where they're already a fan. They already want to know our stuff. They want to know what kind of content's going on the email. The email is more just like updates on interesting thing that's going on in the business, whether it's a, you know, a new promo, whether it's a, um, a new flavor, whether it's a, uh, you know, a new piece of, you know, event that we're doing. So that's where the emails come into components, keeping them up to date, but everything else is the storytelling component that's staying them in the curiosity, keeping their curiosity peaked. Awesome. And I kind of feel like when you're, when we're talking about content, remember that, uh, like 10 years back, we would talk about like how content is king and all of that and write a lot of technical content until the internet was just like overflowing of, con of technical content. And I feel like we're kind of trends. Yeah, just like going into like this other stage of more like story type of content. And I almost feel like what you're doing with Media, Media Squares is almost like having two types of products. So you have the chocolate bars and then you have content as a product too. And that's free for everyone. So uh, people are already getting a value from whatever it is that you're providing them. Yeah, Mariana, storytelling is nothing new. Storytelling has been here as long as we've been human. It's how we've interacted forever. It's how we've connected as communities. It's how we've made our next decisions. It's just the vehicles of where the storytelling has has is is, is outputted has changed. You know, with the you know ten thousand a thousand years ago, we would hunt and gather society. And we would share our stories around a fire about hunting, and that helped us get better at you know, working together to continue our society. But today, storytelling's purpose is the same. It's just, it's on social media, it's on through email, it's through it's through different outlets, but the, the purpose is the same thing. So for us as a business, we couldn't understand why a lot of brands aren't doing storytelling. Sharing content is not storytelling. Sharing a story is hitting on emotional connection. It's hitting on relatability. It's hitting on point components of trust, vulnerability, transparency, things that humans care about deeply. So in a world where attention is probably the most scarce thing right now, because it's it's so much information being bombarded 24 seven to the consumer, the only way to break through that attention barrier is simply to create a story that relates to that consumer or that individual, make them a fan before making them a customer, make them a friend before making them a customer. And how do you do that? You got to go down to human connection and emotional connection. I love it. Cool. Thank you so much. And, um, Okay, so I was wondering, we, uh, we have talked about hacks like throughout the whole uh, event today, and I was wondering if you had any more hacks that are not necessarily storytelling or they're connected to storytelling that people could go and use it right now. I think the key is, is it is just storytelling, but it's, it's it's something other than storytelling. When you are creating your story for your campaigns or your emails or your, your social media, I think what will work best is not looking necessarily at the KPI of the views, the engagement or the return on dollar. I think the best way to do it is to go back to human nature. And what I mean by that is, does this piece of content or advertisement or mailing mail content evoke an emotional response in you? Does it make you feel sad, happy, angry? Does it make you feel anything? If it doesn't, then don't put it out there because for us, what we've seen the most successful in terms of conversion is 
instead of looking at his views, engagement, stuff like that, it's how does it make someone feel? What's the emotion we're trying to evoke? And when we have a clear path of the emotion, we see a huge success in that campaign. Huge. Because again, humans need emotional connection. So if you're not invoking emotion, it doesn't have to be a good emotion, be a bad one. Then you're not getting their attention because they'll scroll right by you. They'll change the email. They'll swipe back, come swipe to the next story on social media because it doesn't make a difference to them, right? Unless they're already a fan of your product, but that's a different story. But before getting them to acquire them, you need an emotional, you need to evoke an emotional connection before getting them to even opt into what you want to do. Hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And I was wondering if you actually are able to create those stories organically as they kind of come up yeah. or if you actually have a sort of methodology or a framework that you use to create them. So two things. So we do both. So one is that whatever naturally happens in a business will happen. For example, we own our manufacturing. If a machine breaks down, we have the the advantage of having the videographers in the office is they can go grab all the emotionality that will happen during that time. And they could pull people aside to interview them in the emotional state that they're in. So you're getting the most authenticity as possible. The second thing is we have campaigns planned. So like that's, that's staged, on, not staged, but it's pre-planned content. So if it's like a campaign for launching a new product, here's the scripts, here's what we need, here's who we need, blah, blah, blah. So I think you as a business need both. That being said, I don't think that every business should take the strategy that Midday Squares took in the sense of we show everything. We show, like I said, therapy, private life. That's our authenticity. I think what you should look at in your advertising or the way you're going to create content as a business is what's authentic to you? What's your core values? What's your mission? What's your why? Then create content along that because our why is to show the world that we can disrupt the chocolate industry that's 100 years old, dominated by five brands by being unapologetically ourselves and being bold. Every piece of content relates to that. And it's a big umbrella, but it relates to that. And I think that brands have lost track of who they are and what they do. And they're so focused on chasing the KPI of revenue or growth of following that they actually start to lose the identity, which ends up eroding your community over time and your fan base. So again, authenticity of your brand is going to drive all the content campaign that you're going to create because that's what's going to break through in this world, again, full of inauthenticity of content. I totally agree. And if I feel like if you're not actually focusing on your um, innermost like pillars and stuff like that, it's not even sustainable for you to kind of like keep an appearance because you don't really understand what's going on because it's just maybe it's just words for you. They don't really mean anything. So how do you actually do things there? Or meaning for war, express that, yeah. right? Find your meaning and live it every day. Like, I know it sounds cheesy and it's like, you hear these things from like those gurus on like social media, but it's true. If you actually are in your flow state, then you are being yourself. And I always tell people this one thing that I learned from college. I studied to be an actuary and I failed miserably. But the one thing I learned was basically what makes you different isn't the product or the campaign you're going to create. What makes you different is you being you because no one has the same DNA as you. They could copy your product. They can copy your campaign. They can copy your service. They can't copy how you make people feel. So that is what you need to embrace. The second thing is, is if you input average decisions every single day, hence following the herd and doing what everyone else is doing into a graph, your output will be average. It'll be a straight line. But if you take that same graph and you input unaverage decisions every single day to it, meaning you just being you is on average then your graph will be outliers, up, down, up, down, up, down. But the idea of that, that's a huge win because if you just look at it as, hey, what I learned on the bottom outlier is that I learned something that I don't want to do again, then it's always a W. And that's what allows you to win really, really big. So I think that that's the key component to building a successful community business today. That's awesome. And are, are there any hacks that you actually tried and did not work for you? Yeah, I think... Um, you know, at first we tried to build on YouTube and it was, it was tough. You know, we tried our content that was working on other platforms and it just didn't work. So like, you know, I think you have to understand each platform that whether it's email, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, these are different platforms for different reasons. The same content might not work and understanding that is super key. For example, people on LinkedIn might not be looking for how you eat food every day and how you cook your meals that people on Instagram might be looking for. It could be the same person, but their mindset is not looking for the same thing. That being said, it's the same thing as email. When someone gets an email listing, uh, as an email campaign, they might not be looking for the same thing that you're putting on TikTok. 
which is, you know, let's say pure entertainment. So I think understanding your out, your your platforms is super important. And we at the first made, we tried to do that where we aligned all the stuff and it didn't work. So um, that's a hack to stay away from. Mm. Yeah, uh, that, that sounds great. And I was uh, wondering about, so since this, we we're talking about email edge here, right? So we we're talking about email marketing. I was wondering uh, if, how do you, like, how do you use email marketing today as a channel? And do you think there's more to be leveraged there at all? Yeah, so email is, I think, responsible for 25, 30% of our, our D2C revenue. Um, and the list just keeps building. But I think that with email, I think it's, when someone opts into an email, they are looking for information or they're looking for um, some sort of, you know, reason from the company. So it kind of gives you a permission, in my opinion, that that is not the same as necessarily someone just seeing your content on social media. So for me, you know, give them value, give real value through your emails. Use that as a source where somebody's giving you the privilege of their attention to earn something. So what I mean by that as a business what can you add value to their life? Not just discount codes, but what else can you add? What, what is it? Is it that you're doing an exclusive launch and you're in their area and it's that specific to them where they're invited to come? Or is it that, you know, you have a, a, a new, a new flavor and you want to give them as a taste tester and they're, because they're on the email, they're the ones that are getting that because these, this is a privilege. Email is a very serious thing for people where they have their emails is not where they play all the time on their phones. And it's a place where they're focused. It's typically where they're working. Sometimes a lot of their working emails or it's their place where it's more serious. So I would say that that's a place where give them value, the, the most value you can offer them. And if it's an entertainment source, fine, but make it really entertaining so that you can, you know, keep them as a privilege to earn their attention from them or earn their email, because that's a platform where I think people are more serious and ready to make action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And it's also to me, as a consumer, I also feel like it's the platform that I use for when I'm not ready to purchase yet, but I don't want to, I don't want to, like lose contact with that brand. You yes. know, I still want, I want something in the future with them to happen. So I want to hear more about them. So that's I, what you know means to me. I 100% agree with you. It's a place where you don't need to sell 24 seven, relax with the selling, you know, keep people informed. Um, you know, give them value so that they're all you're on top of the mind, but when they're ready, they'll come to you. Um, don't force sell because eventually that turns people off. And I get sometimes companies have to hit their revenue markers and all that stuff, but it will just hurt you in the long run because in the short run, they'll get turned off and move on. And you might get their one sale and they're never going to buy again because they're turned off. But if you build that trust, you build that sense of added value over time, they will not just buy products. They will again, sell for you. So it just keeps going. It's a flywheel that can keep going. So it's a privilege and as companies need to remember, it's a privilege to have their attention. Yeah, you're so right. And I actually have a question about that. So, you know how in radio, like the more, um, the more frequent your ads are, the more, you know, important it is. So it's more about like frequency than it is about like the length of the ad, the ad or whatever. So what about email? How do you see that as well about frequency? How important is it? I think weekly is important to be honest mm -hmm. with you. As long, again, the, with the, with the, the context of as long as you're adding value, mm -hmm. if you're not, more time, you know, and mm -hmm. I think like, sorry, less frequently. I think the idea is if you're adding value frequently, then, you know, unless you're catching someone on a bad day, then it's totally fine. Right. And I think at the end of the day, like the more value you give someone, the more usually they feel appreciated or they feel, um, you know, they feel like they got something out of it. Right. So, um, I wouldn't do it every day. I do it. I think once a week is fine. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. once a half is, is good. I don't think you need to be on their mind 24 seven. I think social media is a way that people can have you if they choose to follow you to see you 24 seven or see you daily. Um, mm -hmm. email I don't think is a daily thing in my opinion. Awesome. Okay. And I was wondering about like your entrepreneurial uh, route and if, if there is an entrepreneur that you actually admire a lot and why is that? So I admire a lot of entrepreneurs. I think two of them specifically are, uh, you know, Richard Branson being one. And the, re the reason being is he's authentically himself. He built a brand on his quirkiness and his authenticity. And I don't even know what his brand does to be honest with you, but it's huge. The Virgin brands. And uh, he, he's just a personality. People want to be around that type of energy. So his energy is an, is an inspiration for me. And then the second one is a little bit more controversial for some reason, but um, I respect Elon Musk as an entrepreneur. And the reason why I respect Elon Musk is A, he's doing a lot of creativity and innovation with the products he's creating, whether it's the electric cars or the SpaceX or Starlink or, or you know, Twitter. But I think 
more than that, it's what I get from him is that you could win by being yourself. And you have to understand that in life, if you are unapologetically yourself, people are not going to like you. So he is liked by 50%, loved by 50% and hated by 50%. And he's still able to build these massive companies, right? So what I learned from that is that you being you has its advantages building the fandom, but you being you also has the downturn of people just not liking you or want to be associated with you. And that is okay. You're not going to be liked by 100% of people. As long as you're a kind person and you're a good soul, then keep doing you. Um, if you're a bad person, stop being you. <laughs> Okay, I think this last uh, this last question might connect with that a little bit. So, okay, this is a, a important one. So, if you were to caption the best marketing advice you've ever received as a five to seven word presentation slide title, so imagine that slide title, what would that be? Transparency, vulnerability, and authenticity is the future of marketing. Ooh, I love that. Awesome. Cool. Okay. And let's uh, finish up strong with uh, this last question. So what is the one tactic that everyone should go and try right now? Share your story daily. Stop being scared. There's no reason. You have nothing to lose. You live your story 24 seven. No one else lives it 24 seven. So you might find it boring, but other people don't. You only have to gain as again, as long as you're a good person, you only have to gain if you share your story. The internet is free. Stop consuming it. Start adding value to it. I love it. And is the and did you real did you like see yourselves like kind of learning as you go, like learning how to share a better story, learning how to be more sharp with those stories? Life is about learning daily, if you can. And I think that we're no expert in storytelling. We're no expert in marketing. But we can tell you as we keep getting a little better every day, and that little step forward gives us more momentum to go the next step forward. And then that just compounds, right? So again, use momentum in a positive direction, but you only gain momentum if you try and execute. So um, take the step. Okay, cool. Okay, and, I actually have, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just saying, if anyone else has like further questions, Mariana, um, like for for me, um, add me on LinkedIn, Jake Carls, I'm happy, DM me, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I'm, I'm very active on LinkedIn. So, um, or follow Midday Squares' journey on social. You'll see the storytelling and campaigning that we're talking about today. Nice. Thank you so much, Jake, for today. It was so great. And I actually have one question yeah. out of curiosity because um, because you mentioned um, the guy from Virgin. I forgot his name. But um, so, uh, well, he's known for like creating all different kinds of, of, of products from the yep. same brand. So is that something that you visualize for Midday Squares in the future? One day, I, I, we like chocolate. Um, we're a better for you chocolate bar. Um, we want to eventually go into more chocolate snacks at scale um, globally. So yeah, like I want people to think of us as a modern day Hershey's. If Hershey's were to start today, what would they look like? But we're not in the unhealthy foods. We're in the better for you set. So we're creating functional chocolate bars. And um, that's what we want to do. But I think Richard Branson what, from Virgin Brands, what his inspiration is to me is your authenticity can attract energy so you just need to attract that energy by bringing yourself out there and by the way if people don't like you then it is what it is yeah awesome thank you so much for being here today with us and yeah so there you have it uh tactics advice and just great vibes from six fellow marketers who are here today and especially jay carl's um just closing this up Everyone balancing creativity, boldness, and technique as well to boost growth. So thank you so much for being here with us today and happily emailing everyone. You rock, Mariana. Thank you for having me. Take care. Mm -hmm.